We're now moving on to our second session, and we're taking a bit of a shift. Last, in the first session, we took a, a sort of whiz, whiz bang trip around the world. We looked at what was happening in New Zealand, we talked about asylum seekers, uh, nuclear weapons from all sorts of angles, and so on. But in this session, we're going to run it in a more conventional way with two long introductions, longish introductions, from our two expert speakers, and then an in-depth discussion about what's happening in the Middle East today. And we're going to focus on Iran and Iraq. So I just want to say a word or two before I introduce those speakers about the joint cooperation, about the... Um, Iran nuclear deal. And one of the things that I think everyone in our audience is well aware of is that the announcement by Trump a couple of years ago that he intended to withdraw America from the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, um, was a signal that under the Trump presidency, American and a NATO allied attitude towards the Middle East was going to shift. And I think we've seen the results of that, and most recently we've been listening to news on the television about the um, ludicrously named peace plan for Palestine and Israel, which is the latest demonstration of that. The JCPOA, the anti nuclear agreement was a big success as an arms control agreement in what is rather a wilderness of such agreements. They're very difficult to pull off. And President Obama successfully did it. He brought in the European <coughs> Union and others and successfully negotiated a deal where all parties got something out of it. It prevented Iran from developing a secret nuclear arms program by requiring to restrict uranium enrichment, to limit the numbers and types of centrifuges in operation, i.e the machinery that can um, separate out the um, nuclear weapons grade uranium isotopes, to substantially reduce its stockpile of enriched uranium, to render inoperative the Arak heavy water reactor, that's a type of reactor which as a side product produces uranium uh, weapons grade uranium byproducts and to permit the inspection by the A A E I can't say it Atomic Energy Authority of the fact that this was being all carried out. And in return for that military related sanctions on Iran were lifted. And all parties agree, and by all parties I include the United States government agencies, the Pentagon and various other arms of government, everyone agreed that this was operating successfully at the time when Trump withdrew. What Trump said is that it was only a partial agreement, it didn't go far enough, and he wanted more. And as we all know, he imposed very severe sanctions. I expect we'll be hearing something of that from Abbas in a moment. And his condition for lifting those sanctions is that Iran agrees in perpetuity, no ifs, no buts, that it will never, ever develop a nuclear weapons program and that it would permit the UN inspectors unlimited freedom throughout the country to ensure that that is the case. And as I think we can all appreciate, no self-respecting government could possibly agree to such terms. 
President Netanyahu called the Iran nuclear agreement an historic mistake. He said, and I'm quoting, even with the deal in place and taking the nuclear weapons capability of Iran off the table for at least the next 10 to 15 years, there are still considerable destabilizing activities that Iranians are pursuing in the region, and these are not consistent with US or Israeli interests. And I think I'm not sure if Abbas is going to agree with that. But for me, that encapsulates the whole strategic purpose of America withdrawing from the agreement. Um, and we know what's happened since as part of that moving closer to Israel, which is, let us recall, the only state in the Middle East which possesses nuclear weapons. Uh, America has closed down the PLO's Washington mission, cut off funds to um, UNRWA, the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees, stopped US aid to the West Bank, recognised Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and relocated the American uh, uh, the American embassy there, and of course, most recently engaged in this fake um, peace treaty, which was um, lauded in a press conference held by um, Netanyahu and Trump, to which the Palestinian representatives were not were not even invited. So, now let's, this has not only had repercussions for Iran, obviously it has, it also has an effect on Iraq, and that's going to be the second part of what we hear about today. But I'd now like to hand over to um, Abbas, who is the founder of CASMI, the Campaign Against Military Intervention and Sanctions on Iran to give us the story of what's happening there. Okay, thank you, Carol, and thank you for the invitation. Um, when it comes to the question of the Iranian nuclear issue, a most glaring example of the elephant in the room, as well as a most glaring example of hypocrisy, is that the Israeli regime, which has built with the support, illegal support from Western countries, an arsenal of at least 100 to 150 nuclear weapons has been pressuring the international community, if you want, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, by creating fabricated evidence against Iran's nuclear program, for which there has been never, and I repeat, never any credible evidence that it has any military component. So the scenario is exactly like the non-existent weapons of mass destruction in Iraq that Israel, together with its uh, neocon allies in the United States and in the UK, again created as a pretext to wage that illegal war of aggression, which has resulted to at least, according to the Lancet Journal, a million Iraqi deaths just after the invasion, let alone the 500,000 children who died because of the prelude to the uh, illegal invasion by the sanctions against Iraq. So it is a deja vu situation where immediately after the uh, regime change in Iraq, as was planned by the new conservatives, that we've got seven old rich Islamic defiant regimes, and they should be going through regime change by using the military might of the United States to prepare the United States to confront <laughs> Russia and China in the new century. So they had this plan in the 90s. So after Iraq, that there were six other countries that included Syria and Libya, and it was going to end with Iran. So 
propaganda started that Iran's program has got a component which is military. It's got a military nuclear weapon program. Despite the fact that in 2007, the National Intelligence Estimate of the United States, which is the consensus of 16 intelligence organizations in the United States, agreed with high confidence that Iran does not have a nuclear weapons program. Despite that, they put, they exerted all this pressure on the governance board of the uh, Atomic Energy Agency, International Atomic Energy Agency, and then UN Security Council to put <coughs> sanctions on Iran. They put sanctions on Iran, and after 12 years of uh, diplomatic efforts, eventually in 2015, there was the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA, which was agreed with Iran that Iran would limit its enrichment program voluntarily for a period of 15 years in return for sanctions relief. And this was enshrined in international law by UN Security Council Resolution 2231. And then comes Trump at the behest of Israel, the new conservatives, and this time also Saudi Arabia and UAE, Trump pulled out in May 2018 from this international treaty in violation of international law and called for a better treaty which would include Iran's nuclear, not just Iran's nuclear program, they should have zero en enrichment, but also Iran's ballistic program. So let's be clear on this. Iran has never had, there's no evidence Iran has ever had any military nuclear program. Iran has agreed to the additional protocol of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Snap inspections anytime, anywhere in Iran. They have agreed. And even after Trump pulled out and said that this must be strengthened and enhanced, Iran, by its um, uh, foreign minister, agreed that we would ratify the additional protocol in the Iranian parliament so that Iran would never go for nuclear weapons. And the most important factor actually is that there is a fatwa in place by the leader of the Islamic Republic and has been reiterated a number of times that the production, stockpiling and use of nuclear weapons in, is on Islamic that Iran will never enter into producing nuclear weapons. So if, if the United States, if Trump wants Iran never to enter in that realm, Iran has already said that numerous times. And the most credible proof of this fatwa, that this is something that Iranian uh, leadership, Iranian government will be faithful to, is that when the Western countries were providing all the support Saddam Hussein needed to develop its chemical weapons against Iranian people, Iranian soldiers, and actually uh, wage all these chemical attacks against uh, Iran, uh, for which now we've got 120,000 casualties after uh, more than 30 years in Iran, still in hospitals and in home cares in Iran. After that, the military leaders of Iran went to see Ayatollah Khomeini, the then leader of the Islamic Republic, and they said to him that we have got the capacity to develop our own weapons of chemical weapons, and we can retaliate in kind. And Khomeini said, no, this is un-Islamic. So the fact that for eight years, Iranian population and Iranian soldiers were at the mercy of chemical weapons produced with the support of the West. And the, and the West did not allow a single UN Security Council resolution against Iraq for this. The fact that Iran did not produce its, chemical, uh, its own chemical weapons to retaliate in kind is the best credible proof that this fatwa is something credible, that Iran is not going to build nuclear weapons. So now, Trump said that we're going to have maximum pressure on Iran. So what is the intention? The intention is not that Iran is not going to 
build nuclear weapons because that's not on the table at all anyway. The intention is just a pretext for regime change. And this was very clear in the um, maximum pressure strategy that the, the, uh, the, the US leader, leadership was pronouncing, that this is a strategy to inflict pain so that the Iranian population would rebel against its leadership, that there would be re regime change by riots in the streets. And this did not happen, despite the many grievances the Iranian population have against the Iranian government. When it came to a confrontation with the United States, when, the United States, when Trump uh, assassinated, murdered Qasem Soleimani, Iran's hero of anti-Daesh, anti-Al-Qaeda uh, fight, 90%, maybe more than 90% of the Iranian population rallied in support of its government against the United States. So despite many grievances against the government, when it comes to a conflict with the United States, Iranian population will not go for regime change. We'll defend this government against the United States. Because we have had the 1953 coup d'etat in Iran. So that's fresh in the memory of the people of, of Iran. So what's now happened, as far as the EU is concerned, that EU allowed itself to be bullied by the United States, that in fact what they did, they gave lip service to JCPOA, that we're going to, we want to preserve that and criticize the United States, but in effect they failed to commit themselves for their commitments under the treaty. So they stopped buying Iranian oil, which comprised 90% of the EU trade with Iran. So Iranian um, export of oil dropped by 90%. Uh, so it's now at one-tenth of its uh, amount two years ago. So that's been devastating for the Iranian economy because that, that uh, Iranian oil uh, revenue uh, is an important, the most important component of the Iranian government's budget. So the, the impact of that on inflation, on employment, is horrendous in Iran. So the poverty line has gone up so that over 50% of the Iranian population, and this is statistics of last year, not this year, uh, is below the poverty line. So, that, that, so, the, so there has been no regime change. The maximal pressure campaign of the United States has failed. But despite that, the Iranian people are not going to rise up against uh, their government. So that maximum strategy has failed. Now, the EU said they are going to uh, set up a barter mechanism, INSTEX, so that without exchange of dollars, because uh, the United States, being the uh, empire, uh, controls dollar, dollar and the SWIFT uh, transaction mechanism. So Iran is not able to use its assets to buy medical equipment, for example, to tackle the coronavirus in, uh, in the country, right? So the Europeans said, and this is uh, back in uh, May 2018, that they will set up this barter mechanism so that uh, without dollar exchange, uh, Iran can trade uh, with some European countries and in, in the future with, with more and more countries in the world. And to this day, after more than 18 months, not a single project has been carried out using the INSTEX uh, so-called barter mechanism. So uh, despite the lip service to JCPOA, the EU countries, the, the, three, the EU3, are in violation of the JCPOA, as well as the United States. So it's not just the United States, it's the EU as well. So Iran sends uh, three letters, official letters, to uh, the chief of um, uh, foreign, the EU foreign policy uh, in 2018, and it triggered the so-called dispute mechanism of the JCPOA. And after the, the third letter, it closed the dispute mechanism and gave EU seven months to fulfill its own obligations under uh, the treaty. Otherwise, Iran is going to scale back its commitments based on Article 26 and 36 of the JCPOA. 
Article 26 and 36 of the JCPOA allows Iran, in the case that EU or the United States do not fulfill their commitments, to scale back all its commitments. So what Iran is doing is in complete compliance, complete consistency with the JCPOA. So it's the other countries that have been violating the JCPOA. So despite that, when Iran, starting in May last year, in five different stages, scaled back its commitments legally on the JCPOA, in January this year, Trump threatened the EU, the EU3, that if they don't trigger the dispute mechanism with JCPOA, United States is going to impose 25% tariff on EU cars being exported to, to the United States. And immediately, immediately, sheepishly, obediently, the uh, EU3 followed the, 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 the instruction of the uh, Trump administration. And it, it was laughable because Iran had already triggered the dispute mechanism and it had closed it. And no one paid any attention in a sense. So now the EU is doing that. But they want to snap back the UN Security Council, Council resolution uh, sanctions against Iran. And of course, Iran has threatened that if it comes to that, then Iran will pull out of NPT. Not because Iran wants to build nuclear weapons, because Iran's nuclear program, its civilian nuclear program, is Iran's only bargaining chip so that these sanctions on Iran which are crippling the Iranian economy and inflicting so much pain on the Iranian population can be lifted. That's the only bargaining chip that Iran has. It's got no intention of building nuclear weapons. That's very clear from the uh, fatwa of the leadership. So what's now happening is that what's now happening is that uh, with the coronavirus, the uh, horrendous, colossal pain on the Iranian population has got every aspect of a genocide against the Iranian population. Because this is genocide in every possible meaning of the term, except the name. If you go back to the 1948 uh, Genocide Convention, uh, the gen genocide against a group of people uh, was defined in this um, uh, I want to read this. Uh, it says that genocide against a group of uh, human beings can be um, done in a number of ways, different forms. So one of these forms in Article 2, um, Item C of the Convention is deliberately inflicting on the group condition of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. And this is exactly what the newcons glee. They glee and they, they, they experience joy that we have got this coronavirus and Iran is an epicenter of this in the Middle East. They are full of glee that the Iranian population is in pain and hundreds of people are dying because of this. So this is nothing but genocide against the Iranian population. And I think if you're talking about an ethical foreign policy, we have to call for the International Criminal Court to prosecute the United States and the EU3 for allowing this genocide to take place. Because Iran has got the assets to buy the medical equipment, the life-saving medical equipment that it desperately needs to protect its population, but it cannot pay for it because of the SWIFT transaction system that is controlled by the United States. So this is genocide in every, it's a modern form of genocide. It's not, they're not burning Jews, of course, in gas chambers. They're not burning Iranians in gas chambers, but it's a modern form of genocide. And we have to recognize that for what this is. It's, it's, it is a genocide. And if we are talking about an ethical foreign policy, I think this conference should call on the UK government to stop abiding by the unilateral US sanctions against Iran. Because these sanctions are illegal in international law. The UN, various bodies in the United Nations have said that these unilateral US sanctions against Iran are not legal in international. They're illegal. But the UK is abiding 
and therefore has been bullied to be complicit in this genocide against Iran. So we have to call on the UK government to stop abiding by the U unilateral sanctions, US sanctions against Iran. Uh, it, it should call as a, as, a, as a government which is in strategic alliance with its um, US uh, partner, it should call on the United States, it should pressure the United States to withdraw the sanctions against Iran, at least until the virus is under control, until the epidemic is over, at least for that period, uh, to lift the sanctions against Iran so that the Iran government is able to protect its population. So th th this is my message to this conference, that arms trade and uh, uh, nuclear disarmament are all very good, but at this particular concrete context that Iranian people are dying because they don't have the medical supply to treat uh, or, or, or to contain this um, COVID-19 virus, it is incumbent on us to call on the UK government to stop being the US poodle and give Iran all the medical supply that it needs despite the unilateral sanctions that the uh, United States has imposed uh, on all third parties for this. Thank you very much. very powerful and very immediate message and we'll take it up um, at the end when we have question and answers. I'm going to move straight on to Sami Ramadani from Iraqi Democrats. Uh, Sami has been to our conferences before and spoken about Iraq and the Middle East and today he's going to give us an update. Thank you very much Carol. Uh, and before I start on Iraq I must add that I agree with everything that Abbas has outlined uh, um, today uh, because what's happening in Iran is not uh, very far, far removed from uh, US policy towards Iraq as well and its people and the people of the Middle East in general if we think of the Palestinian people or the Syrian people there are different forms of uh, oppression genocidal type policies uh, towards the peoples of the Middle East, which have been going on for decades. It's not a, a new phenomena, but it has escalated and it has uh, reaped uh, uh, havoc on the peoples of the Middle East to the tune of uh, killing uh, millions of its people over the last uh, 30 years or so. Um, on Iraq in specific, if we're talking about 17 years on, if, uh, if I could just quickly summarize the uh, main consequences of the 2003 uh, invasion and occupation of Iraq, then I would do it uh, this way. Uh, in terms of the human cost, the invasion and occupation uh, within a period of five years uh, claimed the lives of about a million people. And by the way, these are not uh, random figures. If you look at the uh, medical reports of the John Hopkins University uh, team that went into Iraq and tried to estimate the number of deaths uh, in Iraq, they came up with a figure of 650,000 people by 2006, within three years of the invasion. And these were based on actual interviews done uh, at random throughout Iraq. And in fact, they do explain that this was an, an underestimate of the, of the real figures. And they were based on actual death certificates that the families uh, produced to the, to the statistical teams that went into Iraq. So the figure of one million dead is certainly an underestimate if we take the projections from the John Hopkins University team research. Uh, this is in addition to the genocidal economic sanctions. Abbas mentioned uh, genocide in relationship to sanctions. The sanctions on Iraq were from 1990 to 2003. Um, 
And during those 13 years, according to the United Nations' own uh, figures, some half a million Iraqi children died because of those economic sanctions. If this is not genocidal policy, then I don't know what is really. If, if half a million of a country's children uh, die in the process of this impo imposition of economic sanctions. And what they did to Iraq, they hope to do to Iran in terms of uh, tighter and tighter and tighter economic sanctions hoping that Iran will be weakened, its population will become so disgruntled against its own government that they can't capitalize on that and maybe wage war, uh, wage uh, invasions, or utilize regime change proxy forces within, uh, within, within those countries. Um, uh, uh, the other consequences of the war on Iraq, very quickly, is the destruction of its infrastructure whether you're talking about roads, rail, uh, uh, public services of all sorts have been destroyed. And 350 of its most productive establishments, because the state controlled most of the industrial sector in Iraq, and there were some 350 productive establishment. And when I say establishment, each establishment will have 100, 200 uh, factories, all sorts of uh, production units ac across the country. And the first thing that Paul Bremer, who was uh, imposed as ruler of Iraq, did was to take these 350 establishments and he established uh, uh, or drew up uh, with the help of his advisors a chart of these 350 establishments with the name of each establishment and three columns. And he actually published that on the website of the provisional government of Iraq, which he ruled, which he presided over at the time. And the three columns were uh, closure, uh, freezing, and sale. So these uh, the entire productive sector that the state was in charge of was uh, was handled that way. Closure, freezing, mothball actually it said, mothball, uh, and, se and selling to the private sector. Uh, I was in Baghdad uh, recently and uh, uh, not a single bus or public service, a city of 8 million people. When I was a child going to primary school in Baghdad, we used to catch the bus to go to school. Uh, public uh, services were well established uh, from the 1950s uh, onwards in Iraq. We had these uh, British double-decker buses. We used to rush upstairs and sit in them. So Baghdad, you know, is not the same uh, place as it, uh, it used to be. Uh, the destruction ex is extremely deep. The educational system, the health uh, services, condition of women. You know, they paraded that, you know, uh, these uh, lovely invasions we will have will liberate women. They will liberate them in Afghanistan. They will liberate them in Iraq. As if women were not already active for 50 years or more uh, in the public sector in Iraq, in the educational system, medical, medical uh, system, scientists of all sorts, you name it, women were, were, were involved in, in Iraqi society. Uh, so the uh, uh, and and all sorts of other aspects which which time does not allow depleted uranium. They used uh, uh, depleted uranium munition in the invasion of Iraq, and until today, uh, this depleted uranium is actually poisoning the land and atmosphere of of Iraq. It's not in massive. Uh, amount of radiation, but this small amounts of radiation are present and they are poisoning the land and waters of the of the country. And no, uh, you don't even hear about it in the media today because this is an international crime of a massive, massive order and scale. They, they are responsible for using those munitions, they are responsible for poisoning the land and people of the country and they should be held responsible responsible in a war crime of its own, uh, the way they have poisoned the land and the country of, of, of Iraq. The political consequences are, uh, are equally dire. They established a sectarian state in all but name. If you read the Iraqi constitution that the United States uh, uh, helped draft and draw, draw up, 
uh, practically uh, contains within it the foundations of establishing uh, an ethno-sectarian system in the country whereby the president has to be a Kurd, the prime minister has to be a Shia, the uh, leader of parliament, president of parliament, has to be a Sunni Arab and so on and so forth. It goes on with all the ministries, all the senior posts in the country. The level of corruption is unbelievable because when you invade a country and occupy it, who's going to cooperate with you? But quizzlings and corrupt elements. Uh, any decent uh, uh, person who has loyalty to, to their homeland uh, uh, and, their, and their people would not accept to be a tool of of an occupying force. So this, this has become the, the picture. And uh, if I move on quickly as to what is happening today and why do we have this uh, new situation that evolved in the country. And quickly what happened in Iraq is that gradually US domination and control of the country started weakening. And this we have to understand uh, 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 clearly. Weakening in what sense? Uh, because of the resistance to their presence in the country, whether uh, armed resistance, political resistance, psychological, cultural, people don't like to be occupied. So this form of uh, varied forms of resistance has accumulated in the country. And by 2011, they were forced to withdraw nearly all their forces from the country because they could not sustain the occupation. <laughs> Over four and a half thousand US soldiers were killed by, by resistance of all types. And uh, over 100,000 were injured. The injury figures are high because uh, they rotated the, their soldiers in Iraq. Some one million U.S. soldiers served in Iraq on rotational, on rotational basis. So they could not sustain that level of uh, resistance and casualties. So they withdrew, but they left some uh, military bases and they left proxy political organizations, secret militias, secret terrorist groups, all manner of forces they left behind, but their actual massive presence uh, was withdrawn from the country. That immediately weakened them, despite their other forms of presence, despite establishing the biggest U.S. embassy in the world, in the, in the green zone in Baghdad. Uh, that embassy has uh, four or five stories deep in the ground, and some three or four. Uh, I actually saw it during my last visit, I, I passed by it, and it's, it's an incredible uh, sight. The car just keeps driving, and the, that embassy doesn't end. It, uh, it can uh, accommodate 80 uh, football pitches. Um, uh, it has helicopter and uh, airplane landing sites. You, you name it, it's, it's a military fortress, really. It's not an embassy. They were hoping that they could run the entire Middle East, their Middle Eastern presence outside of Israel. They would uh, help uh, center it and headquarter it in Baghdad. The, it's still a massive play interventionist uh, structure in the country, but it's not like they dreamed it would be because it's surrounded. If there is any call for resistance in future, that embassy, I am pretty sure, will be wiped out by, uh, by the resistance because their presence has weakened. And why has it weakened? 2011, they had to withdraw. And in 2014, something very uh, strategic happened, which is the invasion of Iraq by the ISIS forces and the fall of Mosul and most of northwestern Iraq to this terrorist group, the most uh, lethal, uh, the most murderous terrorist group that has emerged in the, in the region. And their forces reached to the out, uh, outskirts of Baghdad, literally some uh, 20 miles from the uh, center of Baghdad. Uh, this uh, uh, galvanized the country in a different way. There was huge uh, concern that Baghdad might fall, that the slaughter of innocent people from Mosul downwards uh, had, had to be resisted. And literally hundreds of thousands of young people uh, volunteered to go and fight ISIS. Especially that the United States, and this is critical, for three months, uh, uh, Mosul fell in June, the United States for three months refused to help Iraq. 
zero, even though they had signed a strategic agreement in 2011 to come to the aid of Iraq if Iraq was threatened by any force, including terrorism. And they refused point black, hoping that they could affect a type of regime change in Baghdad that will suit them. There were contradictions already evolving between the central government and the Kurdish uh, leaders in Iraqi Kurdistan who are closely allied to the United States, and there were contradictions developing with a direct U.S. presence in the country. Now, uh, uh, the United States refusal uh, meant that the uh, volunteering uh, took place at a very rapid pace. And there was a fatwa from the leading uh, clergy in Iraq of uh, various types of clergy, but most importantly, uh, the Ayatollah uh, Sistani's fatwa calling on people to take up arms across the country to resist ISIS. And from there on, the defeat of ISIS started. Iran uh, uh, helped uh, uh, in, that, in that regard, especially in those three months that the U.S. refused to, to help Iraq. Remember, the United States made sure that once they destroyed the Iraqi Air Force in 2003, they made sure Iraq had no Air Force. Even the planes that this quizzling government purchased from the United States, the Phantom uh, jets and other jets they, they purchased from the United States, they refused to, to, to hand them over to Iraq. They, had, they handed over one plane and they refused even to complete the training of the Iraqi pilots on them. So there was a deliberate policy of uh, crippling the country in terms of its ability to defend itself. Um, and uh, ISIS, they, the United States obviously later joined in the fight against ISIS, but they joined it because they realized without coming in, these volunteer forces and the Iraqi state is, is uh, winning the battle. And Iran's uh, presence and support uh, against ISIS was increasing in the country. So they decided to intervene, but their intervention was aerial in most cases, and they destroyed... Uh, uh, they ruthlessly actually bombarded unnecessarily certain areas of, uh, uh, th that were controlled by ISIS, a bit like they destroyed uh, uh, Raqqa in Syria. In Syria. The, the capital of ISIS was in Syria, uh, a town called Raqqa. They flattened it. But what happened in Raqqa was really very significant. And I don't know why and how the BBC managed to broadcast that program that everybody must see how uh, uh, hundreds upon hundreds of ISIS fighters were put on four-wheel drives with their weapons and families and out of Raqqa once the U.S. forces and the proxy forces with them uh, took over Raqqa, the capital of ISIS. Honestly, you must all see that BBC documentary. It's still available on, on their website if you search carefully uh, about uh, uh, the secret deal between the United States and the ISIS fighters, uh, the brutal fighters who were slaughtering people left, right, and, uh, and center. They actually put them in, on four-wheel drives, hundreds of those convoys uh, filmed by the BBC, and nobody knows where they went. The BBC did not follow them, <laughs> right? Uh, Idlib and Iraq, back in Iraq, because uh, their presence in Iraq uh, is re-emerging uh, because of the contradictions that have developed with the Iraqi uh, government, uh, they, they have resorted to, to reintroducing ISIS into the country or turning a blind eye uh, to, their, to their operations. Now, the, the volunteer forces that helped defeat ISIS were not disbanded. And this is what I mean by the change of the balance of forces in the country. These forces uh, uh, number about a quarter of a million. And to, uh, to their last person are anti-US. So we have a massive military force that was established in the fight against ISIS. They are called uh, Al-Hashid uh, forces, Kitab Al-Hashid, uh, the popular mobilization units or forces, depends on, on, the, on the translation, but uh, PMUs, 
popular mobilization forces. And they became so powerful that the state recognized them as part, official part of Iraq's military forces. So you have an, an army, you have police, and you have the PMU. And the PMU are a very powerful force. Initially, they were mostly armed by Iran against ISIS. So they have close political links with Iran as well. So you have this new picture in Iraq. In addition to the psychological, cultural, other uh, uh, forms of resistance against the United States and the way they destroyed the country, you have the emergence of an actual military force that can fight the United States if the orders are issued. And, and that is a huge strategic change in the balance of forces in the country. The United States has lost uh, not its presence in the country, but its full control over the country has slipped out of, it hand, out, out of its hands. And the last prime minister we have, he's still an interim prime minister because he had to resign, although he's still in charge uh, to, in terms of day-to-day -day running of the country, uh, Adil Abdel Mahdi. When he was appointed prime minister, it was these pro- or rather anti-US forces that had the leading hand in bringing him to power. And one of the, uh, uh, what he did was uh, quite interesting in terms of the shift in the balance of, fo of forces. Um, and I will list very quickly why the United States wanted his removal, not because he's wonderful, by the way, or that he's outside of sectarian influences or, uh, or anything like that, uh, but, uh, contradictions developed very quickly with the United States, so they wanted him out. He opened the borders with Syria, a red line. The United States said, you do not open the borders with Syria. So he went and opened the borders with Syria, which meant Iraq, uh, Iraq and the supplies can go to Syria, number one. Number two, uh, uh, he rejected the deal of the century the fraud of the century that Carol referred to on Palestine. And that was a big blow for uh, any hope of implementing the, the, uh, the fraud of the century. Uh, uh, he went and signed what is estimated at $500 billion uh, 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 deal with China in return for oil supplies. No money is exchanged practically. Iraq gives... Uh, uh, 100 to, uh, to 300,000 barrels a day of oil to, to China in return for infrastructure project in the country. Trump phoned him three times asking him to scrap the deal and he refused. He took his entire cabinet to, to Beijing and toured China and signed all manner of contracts for China to move in to establish infrastructure projects in the country. Uh, he refused to impose sanctions on Iran, and that is obviously very significant as far two minutes, I promise. Okay, uh, so he refused to, to, to apply sanctions on Iran, that was a big red line. Uh, refused to disband those PMU forces I'm talking about, the quarter of a million. Uh, he uh, point blank, blank refused, said this is, uh, these are official forces. Uh, he rejected a Saudi wide-ranging economic uh, deal with, with Iraq. Uh, and number seven, he did some symbolic things that annoyed them. He opened the green zone uh, so people can pass by the American embassy and removed a lot of the roadblocks which upset the United States because these were symbolic signs of their presence in the country and nobody should get near their embassy. Um, and I'll end by, uh, by saying that if we want uh, uh, an ethical foreign policy, uh, then uh, we have to think of it, the way I think of it at least, is to think of what is unethical and do its opposite. If war is unethical, we have to stop war. If arms trade is unethical, then we have to stop the arms trade and supplying the Saudi regime and Israel and now Turkey because they are engaged in wars of aggression. If, if, uh, if economic sanctions that are genocidal uh, are unethical, then we have to stop them. If economic aid is tied to conditions to cripple uh, global South countries, then we have to stop it. So there are a range of 
unethical policies that our state here in Britain, in alliance with the United States, break up with the with U.S. foreign policy. If we want to be ethical, we cannot remain a close ally of the United States in terms of foreign policy. Uh, and so there are a range of things which are going on which are unethical. If we stop them, then we lay the foundations of a proper ethical policy. And thank you very much. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you, Abbas. A great deal to take in and to think about. But perhaps we can start with a, a round of questions. Does anyone have direct questions for the last speakers? I can see two hands. Oh, yes, we've just heard uh, from Sami about a deal with, uh, between China and Iran. Um, are there any difficulties about Iran making a similar arrangement to circumvent the United States ban on, on trade? I'll take the second question and then ask you to come back. Yep, please. It's a question and a point. Um, we understand exactly what's being said, but we have to penetrate the stranglehold of the neoliberal mainstream media to get this message to cross. Because out there, there's a million and millions of good people who aren't hearing this and they are being deluged by propaganda. I know, I mix with these people, I mix with a load of Tories, believe it or not, uh, as a volunteer in Richmond. But they believe all this BS, and they're not good. So we, we, we need to spread this message. That means phoning up the opposition, LBC, putting your point across. When they bring up Syria, Iran, and Iraq, you need to get in there uh, as uh, a knowledgeable person and penetrate this, this bubble, uh, and it means writing letters to the, the Daily Mail, the enemy, uh, the Evening Standard, and challenging it, and challenging and challenging it, because otherwise it's not going to end. It's the media, stupid. I think it's the fact that we have two expert speakers that causes the media to attempt to ignore them, myself. Um, <laughs> would you like to come back on that, have us? Yes. Um, well, actually, uh, Iran's main trading partner is China. And um, uh, in fact, uh, it's only China, to some extent um, India, but it's mainly China which has um, stood up against uh, the unilateral US sanctions uh, against Iran and has been trading, has been buying Iranian oil, has been trading in mass with, uh, with Iran. And in fact, because uh, most of the um, supply chain for Iran comes from China. Because of that, Iran was slow in reacting to the uh, uh, COVID-19 virus uh, because that was the only uh, chain of uh, supplies. So, uh, Iran was a bit uh, hesitant and reluctant to close that immediately. And uh, because of that, Iran has become now the epicenter of the virus in the Middle East. Uh, so Iran has been forced to establish close connections with um, China uh, and, of course, Russia as well. So I think uh, Iraq is now following Iran in that, uh, in that story. Uh, so the second question, well, yeah, I completely agree. Um, but uh, there's another component to this because uh, the Israeli lobby is not just active in the United States. For example, the Henry Jackson Society, I mean, this is a, a group of new conservatives and uh, Israeli allies, and they are extremely well-funded, extremely organized. And if you look at any uh, TV chat show on geopolitical issues or even domestic issues, you most often will see one member of Henry Jackson Society. So they're extremely organized to define uh, the narrative, uh, to frame the discourse on Iran and on the Middle East as a whole. Because if the truth comes out, I mean, it's clear that um, uh, you know, we have to really put sanctions on Israel, not on Iran or Venezuela or Cuba or Russia. It's um, Israel which has been 
in violation of dozens of UN Security Council resolutions, and it's been building this racist apartheid regime, and it's completely unethical in everything it does. But uh, the, I mean, it, it just uh, does everything um, with impunity and gets away with murder in a sense. And uh, the Western media turns a blind eye to the atrocities committed by Israel against Palestinians for decades long. So yeah, th that's the most important thing that the the media in this country and other Western countries are controlled by the new liberal forces. And uh, to really crack, to fight that is a major challenge that progressive forces, uh, I think they have to unite. I mean, it's something that I've been saying to many organizations that I mean, one thing that we've got to consider, CND I think should consider, is the uh, Muslim forces the progressive Muslim forces. We may not, CND may not have the same ideological uh, you know, platform as they are, of course not. But in terms of uh, that they are victims of Islamophobia, victims of racism, and they are, they've got progressive agenda to fight against wars and uh, racism and so on, I think that there is a very good chance of an alliance there in action. So I think we have to think about what we can do outside our box. If we just stick to the box that, I mean, so the CND is very old, it's a very prestigious organization, but we have to think outside the box in order to forge that kind of unity and alliance that would uh, really make a difference with the uh, narrative that the um, uh, Israeli uh, lobby and new conservatives uh, and the uh, new liberal media is, is imposing uh, on the public opinion. The only to, the only way to break that is to forge a, a united front with all forces, including Muslims. And I, I haven't seen CND approaching Muslim organizations. I haven't seen stop the war or JDL. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Okay. So I don't want to enumerate them, but as a whole, I think we have to reach out now. Otherwise, we're all going to be doomed in, in our fight, because the, 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 what, what the Israeli state is doing is, is very clear. They want to create chaos in every single country so that they have this empire, like the Roman Empire, you see, they, they, because they were, they were victims of the Romans, of course. Like the Roman Empire, they won't have the authority and all these little vassal states that will be obedient to Israel and live in misery. And, and this is what's also happening in the progressive forces, I think, in the left, because the left is disintegrated, I think. The progressive forces are disintegrated. Everyone is doing its own thing without having a, 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 a unity platform that can bring in all progressive forces. Another round of questions and contributions. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, my, my question is to Abbas. Uh, do you think? Oh, uh, do you think the sanctions now be, being applied against Iraq will be as devastating as the ones that were applied on Iraq in the 1990s? Because uh, in the 1990s, Russia was weak. China was still emerging. So do you think it's a, a totally different scenario these days than it was, say, for example, when they devastated Iraq with the sanctions in the 90s? Any more? I can't see any hands. Ah, yes, I, I have one. Please go ahead. Just a quick question to Sammy. Um, and maybe this was at the end of your, your talk, but I know you had to cut short. But given the recent events in Iraq, in Baghdad, over the past, well, since November, where, with the, the civilian uprisings, um, um, what is your, um, I guess, if 
you could gaze into a crystal ball even though none of us want to do that. I mean, where what is your um, analysis of where that will go, particularly given you know the, the, the movement of young people? Again, we're almost witnessing almost maybe a second Arab Spring, look at what's happening in Lebanon, look at what's happening in Iraq, bearing in mind that you know many of these young people will have been children when the, the invasion of Iraq started in 2003. So what is the lives that they have known? What is the impact of conflict on their, their own agency? And um, what do you anticipate will be happening in the coming months um, with that? Thank you. Abbas, do you want to come back? Yes. Um, so I think there are two conflicting uh, issues here. So one on the issue of Russia and China. I mean, unlike the early 2000s, uh, when Russia and China were really being bullied by the United States. For example, it was with their tacit approval or being neutral that the governor's board of the International Atomic Energy Agency succeeded in uh, reporting uh, Iran's nuclear fire to the UN Security Council. So, if, so, 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 so the Russians, the Chinese, they could have vetoed that. They could have stopped that. They, they didn't. Um, so at that time, I think um, the Russians and the, the, the Chinese, they haven't really woken up to what's uh, happening with the new cons and you know, trying to, um, in a sense, uh, be at peace with the United States. But now things have changed. So now both Russia and China understand that uh, they have to fight uh, for a, a, a multipolar world, not a unipolar world as the United States wants. And therefore, Iran has had strong support uh, from Russia and China in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the nuclear issue. And in fact, uh, Russia has uh, ruled out uh, the uh, snapping back of the um, UN uh, Security Council sanctions against Iran. Um, so the, but but that, that's just one component, and uh, of course we see what happens in, in Syria. You know, R Russia and, and, and uh, Iranian forces have been uh, fighting against um, uh, the, the, the uh, Al-Qaeda and um, ISIS terrorists. Uh, uh, but, but there's another issue that uh, is sort of in conflict with that, and that's the, the new the, the COVID-19 virus. We, we shouldn't really underestimate that in a country like Iran which has been under crippling sanctions for over a year now, and um, its, uh, its uh, health system is struggling to cope uh, without uh, the medical equipment that it uh, uh, urgently needs uh, to, to contain the illness. So, so that's something that, uh, in a sense, did not exist in Iraq under the uh, sanction regime. So uh, potentially, I think potentially, uh, it can become, we can't be, in, in politics, we can't rule out anything. I think it is definitely the case that Iran is much stronger now than Iraq was under Saddam for uh, the main reason that the Iranian uh, solidarity with the assassination and murder of um, Hassan Soleimani uh, in, uh, in, in early January showed that you know, 90, over 90% 90 of the population are prepared to back its government despite the crippling sanctions. So that, that's, that's a significant sign that Iran, the Iranian government is still strong and will be able to, to defy and resist. Um, but uh, who knows? I mean, if, if, the, if, if, uh, if Trump is re-elected and the sanction regime continues, potentially, and, and, and the, the the COVID-19 um, virus uh, spreads uh, further and uh, the, the epidemic in Iran cannot be contained, then who knows what's going to happen? So, and, and that's, that's, uh, that's quite alarming. Therefore, it is important for progressive forces in the West to demand on, on their Western governments to uh, stop abiding by the US unilateral sanctions and, um, and, and support uh, the JCPOA that they have uh, you know, agreed on, that they have um, negotiated with Iran and fulfilled their commitments on the JCPOA. That, that's the only way to uh, end this chaos, to end the, uh, the, mi the, the misery of the Iranian population. Right. Um, on the question of sanctions, actually, I, 
the, the Iraqi state under Saddam was extremely unpopular. And that state was backed to the hilt by the United States itself, building up its chemical weapons program, uh, aiding it for eight years in its war of aggression against Iran. Uh, the use of chemical weapons against the Iranian people was backed by the United States. So when uh, the United States started imposing sanctions on a state which itself had supported, it had much more powerful effect, especially that the Iraqi people overwhelmingly were opposed to, the, uh, to Saddam's uh, regime. So this is a huge, huge difference in terms of the application of sanctions on Iraq as different from application of sanctions on Iran or on Cuba for that matter. Since 1959, they have been applying sanctions on Cuba, but Cuba withstood that uh, incredible uh, siege uh, on it uh, because the Cuban government had the interests of the majority of the Cuban people at heart. So, you know, sanctions can uh, are crippling, are genocidal, <coughs> and so on, but it depends also, also on the state that, uh, that it's being applied, uh, applied against. Um, on the question of the uprising, you're right, I mean, I had a section on it in my head, but uh, obviously I, I already overstepped the mark uh, uh, in terms of the time I took. Um, yes, uh, the, the uprising in Iraq is extremely significant. Uh, 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 one thing I should point out that it's not dead, it's, it's continuing, and it has prospects to take different directions. The balance of forces I was talking about in Iraq <coughs> is also reflected on the streets sometimes. What happened with the occupation of Iraq, uh, the United States became part and parcel of the inner politics of Iraq. So Paul Bremer, for example, <coughs> established over 400 NGOs in Iraq. There are actually over 400 NGOs that were established by the occupation authorities each NGO was initially given $100,000 to kickstart it, and they continued to receive US, uh, US aid. And these 400 NGOs are also engaged in the protest movement. And it's becoming extremely complicated. The protest movement is genuine. It's, uh, uh, it has popular support. It has popular demands <coughs> against corruption, against all manner of ills in, in the Iraqi state. But the United States, unfortunately, has also succeeded in infiltrating it through the NGOs and through social media. And the social media side is not some uh, spontaneous thing. There are well-known names that I know of and I follow on the Internet who are directly allied to the United States and um, they are trying to divert the popular protest uh, movement in the country. So there is a conflict going on in terms of the street as well. Who gets the upper hand in terms of giving, it, giving the uh, protest movement direction, aims, clear aims, clear, clear directions. The pro-US elements uh, that are trying to, to, to front it uh, are trying to divert it into violent ways, like they did in Syria, like they did in Libya. Violence uh, disrupts these popular protest movements because it diverts popular demands uh, for, uh, for, uh, for immediate, immediate uh, services demands, immediate political demands, uh, types of demands that are achievable. Uh, they escalate immediately to overthrowing the entire state. Or, you know, the things which are impossible without the presence of large-scale, well-organized mass organization that can achieve the overthrow of a, of a political system. So they push it in directions which lead to premature clashes with state security forces, with secret militias in the country still operating, and so on and so forth. So the protest movement in Iraq, unfortunately, has this complex side to it that we here in Britain have to be careful about because we instinctively support popular protest movements. Obviously, naturally, I do. I was elated when it started in the streets of, of Baghdad. And it's not the first time, by the way. It's been going on since the occupation uh, started. It took different forms, different aims, different uh, prospects for it. But uh, we have to be extremely careful that the United States has got active elements on the streets 
and it has uh, escalated it in certain areas against the wishes of the people themselves, so that it de degenerates into clashes, uh, closure of uh, of roads, crippling the economy. Who who benefits from crippling? It's the poor masses of the country which benefit from crippling food supplies and so on, and blockading uh, roads. Took forms which are anti anti people. So so I say you know it is continuing and. I am hopeful but extremely cautious because of U.S. intervention through its proxy forces in the country. Thank you, Sammy. Before I bring, I'm afraid that's the end of the questions, I'm sorry. Before I bring the session to an end, I'm going to ask Emma Denko to say a few words. Emma is our latest London Vice President. She joins Bruce Kent. Catherine, who spoke earlier, and Jenny Jones of the Green Party. Um, you, you may not know, but during her brief spell in Parliament, we hope you'll get back again very soon, when she was MP for Kensington, having overthrown the Tories, um, Emma was the vice chair, one of the vice chairs of parliamentary CND, and she's been very active not only on our platforms, but also speaking on anti-war platforms to stop the war and so on. So I'd ask Emma to say a few words on the issue. Emma, over okay. to you. Thank you very much, Carol. Um, and I'm very happy to be here and uh, very happy to meet Sammy. Abbas, uh, we already know he's from Kensington and we had a meeting uh, with um, a group of Iranian residents um, before the election. Um, and we have all the issues we've, he we've heard about are kind of brewing and there's uh, um, a lot of concern, obviously, about, about what's going on there. And we're kind of we're looking at, it's really interesting to hear all the different angles, that this kind of Western saviour, we're going to go and save these people, and it's a kind of different form of a very brutal colonising, isn't it, well, you know, with the colonisation via, via war or threat of war. Um, so, yeah, I have been, I've been, um, um, I've known Bruce Kent for nearly 50 years, um, um, and uh, so I've been a involved in the peace movement for a very long time half a century on and off um um yeah so i you know i lost my seat um i will be back uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> they yeah, really yeah. don't want to hear that but i'll be back um you know i'm in it for the long haul um i was actually waiting for a peerage and it, it must have got stuck <laughs> in a place <laughs> and i had the perfect title which is going to be baroness republic of kensington doesn't that sound good <laughs> but i thought after after hearing what we're talking about it should be baroness nuclear free republic of kensington so i think we'll stick to that i may change my twitter handle uh, so i mean we've been hearing about abbas was saying that we had to get out of our box and people said that to me a lot you got to get back in your box or get, don't get in your box or whatever it is and somebody we were having a debate about this on twitter one day when somebody had, had heard enough of me and said I should get back in my box and somebody said no Emma get stand on the box so I thought that was really good so we're going to stand on the box we're going to get out of our box and uh, think much wider and stand on the box that they're trying to put us in so I just think that's a, a just a good thought because actually CND is the most extraordinary organization um, and we need to support it and what an incredible uh, foundation we can stand on so yeah I'm massively honored I didn't get my peerage but being a uh, vice president of London CND it's was a massive up. honor <laughs> absolutely massive honor um, it's not honorary actually they asked me to do things which is fine um, <laughs> and one of them is uh, today my job rather than trying to follow either of our experts here which would be um, it wouldn't be, wouldn't work out well I don't think um, is uh, is to ask for um, for for you to put your hands in our pockets to to support the incredible work that people do for nothing or next to nothing as we know um, all the reports and meetings and pledges and lobbying and leaflets and so on um, so the, the reports that come out of this organisation are just extraordinary. Um, um, a, 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 little, a little money goes a long way. So I'm going to introduce you to this museum piece, <laughs> which is quite extraordinary, right? So this is a museum piece from our fundraiser here, uh, from, from the Midland Bank. And um, I don't know if you... Do we have to use white gloves to use this? Anyway, it is, <laughs> it is quite fragile. And I just want to say it's best to put paper money in it than, <laughs> than noisy, um, hard money. So um, 
and I think we had to treat it with respect and fill it as far as possible with paper money. And I'm going to kick off here uh, by putting spectacularly. Uh, um, yes, it's not plastic; it's paper. It's not plastic, uh, but paper money. Um, so if you don't have any paper money on you, or you have to put a few coins in, um, there, there is a, um, a link to a direct debits. I think. Uh, five pounds, cup and price of a cup of coffee, uh, depending on which part of London you are. Not in Notting Hill, I'll show you. But uh, I'm sure you can get um, a five pounds a month or anything, really. And that will keep us all talking, keep us debating, keep on bringing us together um, and influencing the press. And I do think we've got a, one hell of a battle um, until we can sort out some alternative media. Um, I was screwed over by the Observer who, who published yeah. all the Lib Dems. Uh, yeah. um, dodgy bar charts as if they were true. Um, and friends of mine believed it and they said, oh, sorry, Emma, I've seen it in the Observer. So, you know, that we, we are really up against yeah. it with the media. Um, but um, I'm uh, always uh, optimistic and we'll keep going. Just fill this up and I'll hand this back to you. I'm You'll have to white is, gloves now. This is plastic, I'm afraid. Plastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. MS, MS was paper, so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I think we all take a moment to say thank you very much for this panel. Thank you. Thank you.